So good morning. I think this, this is actually an easy one to engage on. I think it's relevant for all of us. And I'm not going to be talking about bladder cancer or anything specific. It's just musings about the publishing world um, in 2020. And I think um, you can see I, I don't usually list it on, on, with um, affiliations, but I am editor-in-chief of the SIU Journal, which is the reason why I'm sort of thinking about these things more um, these days. So I'm just going to touch on some topics rather broadly. Why do we publish? Um, what's going on in the peer review world? Why you should all get involved in peer review? Uh, we'll go over a little bit what's happening with ac uh, open access and linked to that predatory journals, which are a huge problem these days, and then some new trends in, in publishing. So why do we publish? I mean, the, the Martin Gleaves of the world publish, of course, because they're making impactful research findings that need to be disseminated to the world so that we can all you know, learn from that and, and improve practice or advance the science in the lab or engineering, whatever it might be. Um, I think in this room and in a lot of places, there's a lot of the, this publish or perish idea. You know, the undergrad students have to publish a paper or two to get into medical school, or maybe the medical students have to publish to get into residency. The residents have to publish to get into fellowship. The fellows have to publish if they want to get a job. And then we all have to publish if we want to get promoted. And um, sometimes it's driven by the need to publish. The research is driven by the need to publish and, and not the other way around, which is um, you know, a little bit unfortunate. There's often this emphasis in academia on the scholarly work over the educational contributions. So teaching, um, giving lectures and courses, whatnot, uh, and also the service component, which is, which is important. Um, I think from a resident student fellow point of view that, that writing papers is actually a really important exercise because you're reading papers all the time. Everything that we do is driven by what's in the literature. And if you're um, writing papers, submitting papers, getting the peer review back, responding to that, you understand the process and it helps you interpret the data. Oh, wrong way. So, you know, with that, that in mind, it's kind of understandable why there are so many journal, journals, even though it, if, you know, if you look at the, the slide I put together of all these different journals, that's still only a sampling of some of the urologic journals. It is astonishing how many journals we have, but ultimately there are hundreds of thousands of scientists around the globe who need to publish. And uh, most of the journals fit some kind of niche. We have our Canadian Urologic Association journal, for example, there are regional journals like the European Urology Journal. Um, and there's society journals. There's one, you know, just for bladder cancer. I mean, subspecialty journals. So there's one just for bladder cancer. Of course, there's an endourology journal. There's every kind of journal you can think of. I think peer review uh, is critical, and I think we've start, I've started with the residents and fellows trying to get them into peer review a little bit, so they're exposed as residents. I certainly, when I was a resident, um, these were the devices we uh, we carried around back then. Um, didn't know anything about peer review. I wrote a couple of papers, as most residents do, to uh, you know explore the academic world. And I never thought of myself having a role in peer review. It just wasn't anything I thought about. Um, and then as a fellow, advanced to BlackBerry, of course, um, one of the staff says, hey, can you write, a, write this review by Monday? I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> but, but you don't really know what you're doing. You just start, kind of start writing. Um, and peer review really is the foundation of the publishing, publishing process. The idea is that the science uh, is vetted by the peer reviewers. Of course, if you have peer, poor peer review, it's not really being vetted adequately. And we do see a lot of that. In our journal clubs, we often question how something's got by the peer review. So it's an imperfect system, but that is the point. Um, and I think for you know, the junior members in the room, you should see peer review as an opportunity and not necessarily a burden. I've invited many people over the years to do peer review and you see people who jump at the opportunity and those, even though they're publishing prolifically, will always say no, or they will always simply ignore your invitation. Uh, I have a little, I have a mental blacklist of some people out there who, who never participate. But, uh, so I think it should really be part of our, our, our training. Um, I think the, uh, you know, David A. Anthony and others, residents have, have really, instituted this uh, critical appraisal curriculum um, in the context of, of uh, journal club. Um, but the peer review goes beyond that as well. You're, you know, you're certainly learning a topic in depth when you're reviewing a paper. 
Um, you're learning how the research is conveyed and how, how best to do it. You are telling others how to do it better than they have done it. Uh, there's, if, you're, if you're reviewing for a, a good journal and if you have an area of subspecialty interest, then you're often getting really exciting stuff before anybody else has seen it. Um, so there's, there's that side of it as well. Um, you don't necessarily get that if you're reviewing for, you know, BMC urology or something, but uh, you do get it for better journals. There's the, uh, the challenge of, you know, you, it's up to you to, to vet this paper appropriately before it gets published and, and you want to make sure that, that nothing bad slips through. Um, you have an opportunity to, to shape the article and actually improve it. I think most articles you get, you immediately see how it can be improved. And so you're contributing in a sort of altruistic way to that improvement. Uh, I think some authors, uh, some reviewers rather, miss this concept of duty to give back. But if you're publishing, and if you're you know, publishing 50 papers a year, uh, you're not going to have a lot of time to peer review, but you really should, <laughs> because all of your 50 papers a year are, are being peer reviewed by others. Um, and I love this bottom quote, because it's, it's really pure propaganda by, by a publisher, but a thriving scientific community in your field means more funding, more opportunities, and more collaborations for everyone. So that's a publisher trying to get you to do peer review. There are uh, courses online, so you can um, you know, click on any one of these and it'll lead you through how to do a, a peer review when you're new to it. What you'll find is experienced peer reviewers typically don't stick to any kind of um, template. They just kind of start writing about what is good and what is bad about the paper. Usually you don't write very much about what's good, you just write about what's bad. Um, I also think it's important, um, I, you know, I didn't notice this when I was starting out, but um, if you're invited to do peer review and if you write good peer reviews, people will actually recognize you for your peer review. You'll run into people at meetings, you'll meet, you know, an old guy you've never met before. And they're like, oh, you're that person who wrote this in this review. They actually recognize the reviews. And then you get invited to, you know, write editorials based on a good review. Um, so if you submit a review to a paper and, it, and it's, you know, it's good quality and it, and it gives sort of a, maybe an opposing opinion to what is published, the editor might ask you based on that review to write an editorial, which basically incorporates your own review. And so things like that, that help you um, take the first steps in an academic uh, career. And then you get invited to actually write, um, you know, co-author peer um, review articles and, and other things. I think the Achilles heel of the process is that it's a lot of work and it's not remunerated. So you are dedicating potentially hours in your day, uh, week, month, um, and you're doing it in an altruistic way that uh, does help the field and it does help the authors, um, but ultimately the publishers are also publishing, uh, benefiting a lot from our efforts and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, certainly, you cannot say yes to all requests. You have to learn to say no, uh, because there are always a flood of requests the further along you get. So it's not a perfect process. Um, the journal, almost all the journals are operated by a big publisher, you know, Elsevier, Wiley, whichever. Um, it's a very prof profitable business for the publishers. The um, research is all funded by grants and institutions, the work, including writing, doing the research, writing the papers, doing the review, even the editors handling the papers is all done for free. It's all volunteer for the most part. Um, European neurology editors, for example, do make a stipend. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a massive amount of money, essentially, that we are investing in the journals. This is an interesting paper published last year where they estimated the number of, of hours spent on reviews around the world. So it was greater than hundred million hours. They did have the average length of time for review, review was fairly long. So that, that number may be um, lower than hundred million hours, but, uh, but still, even if you, you know, drop these numbers by, by half, it's, it's still uh, a lot of money. And they came up with a figure of $2.5 billion monetary value of peer review in just three countries, US, China, and the UK. Um, so whether or not the numbers are, act are accurate, it is an enormous investment that we all are putting in the, 
publishing uh, business or the publishers, perhaps. So this is a traditional model. The uh, authors are funded by an institution or a grant, or a lot of research, of course, is done without funding. They write the paper. The publisher gets it, send it out, sends it out to the editor and, and peer reviewers for free, and then sells it by subscription to either readers or mostly libraries. And the libraries are often the same institutions <laughs> that funded the research. So they're paying for the research and they're paying for their people to read the research when it's all done. Um, so certainly a faulty model. So open access is supposed to be one solution to the problem. You know, open access, as as the name implies, is that the, the paper, as soon as it's gone through peer review, is posted online for everybody to see immediately for free. Uh, one interesting thing is that the authors keep the copyright, um, which in most cases doesn't really make a difference. But uh, And the idea is that everybody in the world can then uh, access the research without cost, without barrier. Uh, so, you know, it's a good, it's a good idea if it, if it works well. Um, the idea is if you have a computer, you can access it wherever you are. Uh, the publishers though, will, will cover the cost of production by taking publication fees. So the money's just coming from somewhere else. Instead of taking the money from the universities and libraries, um, from subscription fees, you're charging the authors. And you could say, well, the authors maybe are coming from places that can afford it and uh, places that cannot afford the subscriptions now have access to it. So maybe it's more equitable, who knows? Um, but the journals are still making money. So it's not really um, a solution to the problem. There are very well-respected journals. Uh, the AACR journals, for example, Clinical Cancer Research and Cancer Research, have um, long charged page charges. So if you have a, a color figure, for example, you pay you know, $600 or something. Um, so it, you know, paying is not always bad, uh, but it does also open the door to these predatory journals. So there, if you have to pay to publish, it opens the opportunity for journals just to, or for people to set up a journal and start soliciting your papers just so they can take your money and put the journal on a web page somewhere. There's a question really, I mean, I understand the need to charge for color photography, high resolution pictures when you have a, a, a hard Paper, copy. Yeah. Now everything is digital. So why does that persist? Yeah, I don't know. So it's, it's a good money maker, so why get rid of it? I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're right. It's the, the justification was the uh, actual hard copy publication. I think some of these journals may actually may still have hard copy journals. Um, not everything's gone online, but uh, I'm not sure. So plan S, I think, is something that we all should have heard about, um, not necessarily heard about before today, but it's worth talking about now is uh, there's, so the Coalition S is, a, is a, a group of funders in Europe and, and also some international agencies, includes, for example, the WHO, that uh, are demanding that all research that they fund is uh, published in open access journal. And of course, if you have a, a big swath of funders, it means that's a lot of research that has to go in open access journals, which is potentially squeezing out non-open access journals so that the publishers and different organizations like European Urology feel the pressure to have an open access journal so they can tap in to the work published by these people. Um, and Plan S is, a, you know, is, is well organized. They, there are calls for developing the appropriate infrastructure, which is not necessarily all in place yet, um, but it's a big push towards open access. And these are some of the funders you can see the, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, you might have heard of, and the Bill and Melinda Gates. Otherwise, most of them are, are national organizations that you wouldn't necessarily have, have heard of. Um, and there's a lot of rules, but there's some interesting things. So the authors keep the copyright. Uh, usually when you publish a paper in a journal, one of the first things you do is you sign overall copyright to the journal. Um, usually your, your institution is, or the funder is supposed to pay publication fees. I don't think we necessarily see that. I think if we want to publish open access, we have to come up with the money. Uh, I was talking to someone, uh, a, a professor in Lund, Sweden, on the weekend who uh, at his university 
they are obliged to publish open access and the university pays for everything. Um, and so it just totally skirts uh, the issue. I think that's where the field is, is moving in Europe. Um, and then uh, an important one as well is funders, meaning when you go for a peer review of a grant that you've submitted, the people doing the review are supposed to look at the quality of the work and not the journal it was published in, which I think is, is an illusion in our world. Um, you cannot, you're not going to pull up the papers, uh, you know, 50 papers of, of the person whose grant you're reviewing and, and actually look at the quality. You're going to see what journal it's in, and maybe you'll be familiar with it. And, and that ha is how it works. But, but that does speak to one of the limitations of this is that we're all dependent on publishing in well-known high impact journals uh, to further our, our careers. So on the North American side, the University of California uh, did something that was a little bit similar to this, this Plan S. Um, it wasn't a, a sort of a formal uh, future looking plan, but 10% of all publications in the US come from the University of California. So the multiple universities in all the different cities in California, population of California is about the same as it is as population of Canada. Um, but they were paying, the university system was paying more than $10 million of subscriptions to Elsevier. So they basically one-sided unilateral movement said, okay, we're going to stop all subscriptions to Elsevier because Elsevier wasn't negotiating fairly. So they did that in 2019. And, and there, there's stories like the, the provost at UCLA telling faculty not to publish in an Elsevier journal and not to peer review for an Elsevier journal. And, and the other universities followed. And of course, they've now come up with, with a new agreement that ultimately a lot of people are still making a lot of money, but uh, it's better for the university than it was. I think the European urology model is an interesting one. So you have a very successful uh, parent journal, European urology, and then they launched two new journals, Focus and Oncology, built very much on the same model. So it's all about subscriptions, you know, the same processes both immediately very successful because they were building on the European neurology name. It's like if you're JAMA something, you know, JAMA surgery or whatever, you're going to do well because you're building on the JAMA name. Um, but now they have a European neurology open science. And so this is an open access journal that of course we all want to publish in because it's European neurology and they charge you uh, $1,800 um, for publication fee. You could publish the same paper at CUAJ for free, um, but it doesn't have the European neurology uh, title to it. So I, you know, I find it objectionable. Um, EAU has a ton of money. They could easily do this without publication fees. It's not an expensive process. And I refuse to um, review or write for European neurology open science. So Peter, um, how is this different than predatory publishing? Well, we'll get to that. It's, it still offers top quality in every regard. They're just, they're taking your money, but they're delivering a service. The predatory journals and where they differentiate themselves is they take your money and they offer no service. So they don't do quality peer review. They accept everything. They, um, we'll, we'll get to it. It's, it's, it's next. <laughs> There's the, the term uh, diamond open access, uh, which refers to the journals that don't cost anything to anybody except the organization that runs them. And so that's the CUAJ is a diamond open access journal. It more or less breaks even with some advertising dollars, which you know makes sense. Um, the Indian Journal of Urology is the same, the Brazilian Journal, the Chilean Journal, and then the SIU Journal. Um, but of course, people still want to publish in the bigger name journals. So predatory journals, uh, the term predatory journal comes from this guy, uh, Jeffrey Beale, who started a, a Beale's list of journals that seem to um, feed off the needs of people to publish, even though they didn't necessarily have the quality of work that was publishable. Um, and the, it, this uh, Bentham's Open was a publisher that appeared out of nowhere and had all these journals, and uh, it seemed to be running just for its own financial benefit. Um, and there's a lot of low quality uh, research. Um, he eventually had to shut down his list of predatory journals because he was uh, threatened legally by the publishers. But the definition of predatory journal is um, 
are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship, characterized by false or misleading information. So we all get emails. Some of us will get more than a dozen of these emails a day. Uh, they do not follow best audit editorial or publication practices. So they're not, they're, they're all sorts of organizations that you have to be accredited by if you're a journal. These journals will not be accredited by any of them. They will not necessarily have the formal, um, was it ISSN, I guess, the registration number of a journal. There, there are a lot of signs, although it's sometimes hard to figure it out for sure. <coughs> they typically have very aggressive Solicita solicitation processes to the point that if you got a request to submit a paper from a reputable journal, you would assume <laughs> that it's not a reputable journal because almost all of these solicitations come from junk journals. The terminology people, some people don't like the term predatory journal because a lot of authors know exactly <laughs> what these journals are and they're not being preyed upon. They're, they're complicit because they need to publish. And um, so they will, they will, um, it, it's not, you know, the, the term illegitimate publishing comes up as well. The, the other thing is that a journal that has poor quality is not necessarily predatory. <laughs> they may just be a, a poor quality journal that doesn't do peer review well. I mean, the, it doesn't have to be uh, done in a malevolent way. So there are a lot of warning signs. Um, I actually, I, I went through this uh, not that long ago with uh, with a paper that Anna was uh, submitting, trying to figure out with her if the journal was predatory or not. I must say, in the end of the day, I could not tell. It seemed like it, but it was not obvious. Uh, so the unsolicited requests we talked about, uh, near 100% acceptance rates. You don't necessarily see that, though. You don't see what's being submitted. You only see what's published. Uh, they always sell speed. You know, We'll have this published within 14 days. There's no way they're going to get adequate peer review in 14 days. Uh, the journals are not indexed. So that's an easy one to look at, but all, all new journals are not indexed either, right? So the SIUJ, SIU journal is not indexed yet because it takes a couple of years to get there. Their names will often play on names that you're familiar with. So we all know Journal of Urology, so it'll be Journal of Urology and Nephrology or something. You just throw something else in there so that you think that you're maybe going to the reputable journal. Um, minimal or no peer review, I, you don't see that until you've submitted it. So there's a journal, uh, OncoTarget, which used to be reputable and had a reasonable impact factor. Um, I remember submitting a paper there and getting back to peer review, and, and there were two reviewers and there was one sentence, like, nice paper. Uh, and that, you then say, okay, there's something wrong here. <laughs> and, and since then, it has been sort of uncovered as a, as a junk journal. Um, so why do they exist? Of course, it's all the financial pressures. You know, back in the day, you would go to the publisher and the publisher had to invest money in converting your work into a print publication that was then disseminated around the world. Um, but that's all being digitized now. So the cost actually has gone down, but the prices have gone up. And it's, it's quite remarkable to, to see how high the prices have gone uh, compared to inflation on this figure, and, and, and especially when you consider that the cost of production has gone down so much. But the, the demand is there, so people are willing to pay, which is why it continues to happen. Um, there are a lot of countries, you know, I'll, I'll show a slide, I think, in a minute here, that a lot of this comes from Asia, India, and Africa, and there are a lot of people there who need to publish uh, in international journals. Um, and uh, so paying to publish is certainly easier and faster as long as they have access to the funds. The problem is, uh, or, you know, there are several problems to this, but it really erodes the, the confidence or the quality of the scientific literature. You, you're no longer as a consumer of the scientific literature, especially as a lay person, you're not really able to tell what is what. Um, the worst case scenario is advocacy research where they're actually journals that are created just to spread uh, misinformation, right? It doesn't have to be in, in medicine. It could be in, in other fields as well. Um, that uh, looks like scientific. So, you know, one of the typical debates you might see in American politics, people will be able to cite scientific sources of their opinion, where that opinion is the so-called advocacy research, where it's, it's really made up to back what they want to say. Um, and, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen as much in medicine, but uh, 
me skip over some of that. So the interesting, an interesting question is what happens to the authors, so the prey in the, in the predatory journals. Uh, so it is stigmatizing. You never want to list this on your CV. Uh, if you know that you've published in a predatory journal, and if you're certainly in our system, uh, you would just hide that. <laughs> Ultimately, you would like, if you recognize it and it was accidental, you would like the paper to be withdrawn or taken off the web page or whatever, but it's very hard to get the publishers to do that. Um, but if you have that paper in your CV and somebody notices it, raises issues about you and what your intentions were, were even if it was accidental. It's a big problem. Uh, these are numbers from 2017. There were 30,000 academic journals and 10,000 predatory journals. So one quarter um, of all journals of course, they don't necessarily publish nearly as much as the academic journals. Uh, so it, the, the proportion of articles will be much lower. But in 2015, there's an estimate of more than 400,000 uh, articles in predatory journals. This shows the, uh, where they're coming from. So on the left-hand side, where the authors are coming from, and the right-hand side, where the publishers are coming from. And you can see the in the... Uh, authors one, the pink is, is India, the light blue is uh, Asia without India, and the orange is Africa. So that's where most of it's coming from. It's not necessarily coming from North America and Europe, although it's, we certainly have some of it here as well. And you see these, these are interesting numbers that compare the proportion of you know, quality research in, in reputable journals versus um, predatory journals. In the US, it would be 6% uh, in predatory journals. And then India, 277% in, uh, in predatory journals. And Nigeria, you know, vast majority are in predatory journals. Are these all in English? Uh, I don't think they have to be. I imagine most of them are. Processing fees, I'm going to skip over that for a second. So. One of the questions then is how to recognize uh, a predatory journal. And as I alluded to, it's not always easy. There are very formal criteria if you want to you know, pull out the book and, and run through it. Most of us don't have time for that. There are the 16 principles of transparency, which I won't get into. Um, there was one I was going to want to, there's, uh, does this work? If you look at number 11 here, for example, publishing schedule is often an interesting one. These journals will, they'll often have been around for six, seven years and they will sporadically publish an issue and an issue may only have one paper, but there's no schedule to it. And so that I think is a very easy way to recognize it. And any journal that's going up for indexing and, and PubMed, one of the first things you have to show is that you, you had a schedule, like you, you wanted to publish at whatever intervals by whatever date of the month and that you actually attained that. So if you're doing it every other month by the 15th of the month, you have to actually do that. And um, so it's a, you know, it's, it's a seemingly trivial aspect of these that will actually tell you. So this is an email just to, to go through the exercise. This is now uh, almost two years old, but the typical email you get, Avin's publishing group, doesn't mean anything to me, could be good, could be bad. They actually address it to me. They didn't address it as, you know, Dear Dr. Chu, sending me an email, Dear Dr. Chu, you get a lot of that. Um, and it's the Journal of Urology and Nephrology. Sounds legit. I mean, it sounds, I'm sure there's a Journal of Nephrology, certainly a Journal of Urology. Um, they are looking for uh, contributions and they're actually fairly transparent. They, they tell you how much it's gonna cost and it's not an exorbitant amount. They don't really oversell it. Um, so that you could think, well, you know, maybe, maybe they really want, um, maybe they're a quality journal and they, and they want a submission from me. So you go to their webpage and it actually immediately looks like, you know, quite a nice webpage. So it's definitely professionally done. Um, this person here, the editor in chief seems to be a reputable person. Question is, does he have any idea that he's editor in chief of this journal? And, uh, so I, I looked them up their address, you know, they have one address in India and one address in Maryland. And of course it's, you know, a small house in a residential neighborhood, which uh, is a little problematic. And actually um, found, I, I went and found something else that described this publisher. I mean, there, there are then articles out there or blogs or whatever saying how problematic some publishers can be, not necessarily the specific journal, but the publisher. 
And this publisher is, is well known for having um, moving addresses. So every journal has a new address every, every month. But I went back to the editorial board and, and was flipping through some of the editors who, uh, who looked like pretty good people. And I came across this guy, uh, Vitaly Margulis, who was a year behind me in fellowship at MD Anderson. <laughs> uh, does a lot of kidney cancer. Um, and he's at UT Southwestern. That's, this is all true. The description is true. Uh, so I reached out to him and said, hey, did you know that you were uh, on this editorial board? And of course, he had no idea <laughs> that he was on this editorial board. So it was not real. Um, but a lot of it otherwise looks good. This is So they've had 29 papers published over five years, which is not enough. You may say, well, they're, you know, they're struggling. It's hard times. There's a lot of competition. Maybe uh, you know, next year is going to be the year. Um, but uh, they do have volumes and issues, which is good. There are no dates with these. You know, there's two papers per volume. It all looks very suspect. Even a new journal will have sort of a minimum number of papers per new edition. You're not going to put out an edition with just one paper. You're going to wait until you have enough to put out a proper uh, edition. So, and they're very transparent about the publication fee. So there's some hints there that it's not completely um, above board, but it's, but it's hard to tell. So what else we know, the, the journal is not linked to an academic society or any organization, it's just out there, uh, which I guess some journals are, most of our journals are linked to somebody. Uh, this, this serial number, this ISSN, um, is not found anywhere in the, in the various uh, databases other than on the ISN webpage. So maybe that is a sign of legitimacy. Avon's publishing was on Beale's list. Beale is the guy who created the list of, of predatory publishers before it was uh, taken down. Um, and of course, we can't say anything about peer review or, or the intent. There are tools uh, to help you decide. So if you go to, if something's listed on PubMed, it usually means that it has been vetted for quality, but there are certainly some junk journals on PubMed. There are a lot of good journals that can't get in PubMed because they are relatively stringent. Um, and as I said, it takes a couple of years to get there. So if you're not there yet, you may come across as being predatory. The directory of open access journals is a must uh, for these journals. If they're not there, they shouldn't be considered serious because that does not take time. But if they are there, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're quality. This is the directory of open access journals. These are the various lists that you can look up. Uh, some of the, the lists that are still active our uh, subscription list. You have to pay to have access to the list, uh, which doesn't help us for the most part. Henry Wu in uh, Sydney, Australia, started the Urology Green List, um, which was all urologic journals. Unfortunately, it's, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. <laughs> yes, I, he's an associate editor in the SIU journal, but the journal hasn't made his list yet. So. <laughs> It's a problem. Um, this is an easy one, the Think, Check, Submit. You can just type this in Google. You can go to their webpage. It'll give you sort of the checklist to look at, and then um, it can help you out. The bottom line is if you're submitting, it's easier submitting. because I think we all want to submit to journals we know. It's, it's more difficult if you're, if you're asked to publish something or if you're uh, peer reviewing for something. But if you, if you wouldn't submit your paper to a journal, you don't want to read, or you wouldn't read it, you don't want to review for it. So now, what, how can we get rid of this problem with predators? Uh, um, these, these lists have not worked very well, uh, you know, like the Beals list and the other uh, lists or Henry's green list. Um, the, uh, the journals seem to, to adapt and are, are still, the, the business is flourishing. Um, the quality criteria, there are more and more quality criteria. So I've learned with the SIU journal that uh, you know, it takes a year or two to jump through all the hoops with all these uh, organizations. Uh, and in the end, you have all these stamps of approval on your webpage, but I don't think that the end user necessarily recognizes all of that. Legal prosecution is, is the, uh, uh, the exception. So the Omics Publishing Group, there's 700 different journals. They were sued in uh, US courts, but they are in India. And they were asked to pay $50, $50 million in damages for misleading um, authors. And uh, the question, of course, is will they ever pay? I mean, I think that answer is obvious. There's no reason for them to pay in the US if they can continue publishing where they are. 
So what's going on in 2022? What's new? I think maybe not new anymore is this idea that everything is being disseminated through Twitter. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, this is nothing to do with quality or anything else. It's just if you publish these days, you will often, or somebody, if it's not you, will put it out there on Twitter. And so I was talking to Andrew before this, the first place that we'll often see of a new publication is on Twitter. I know Dr. Glee will disagree with that, but uh, if, if you're on Twitter, it's just, there's this immediacy of, of things coming out. There's a new trial of adjuvant um, immunotherapy and kidney cancer that came out in the last week. And it's just, it's immediately there and you see it. And I'm not one who's necessarily gonna follow um, exactly what's going on in all kidney cancer uh, publications, but it's, but it's important. I think where it gets a little bit sketchy are the people who only live on Twitter <laughs> and don't actually publish or do anything else. And it's all about their, their Twitter presence, but that's not really related to, to what we're talking about. The journals are also moving much more towards the, the multimodal experience. So European Neurology has had their surgery in motion for a long time now, but, but surgeons like videos. And um, so video editions are nice, but they're actually difficult to produce in high quality and, and they're relatively expensive. I think that's why we haven't seen that explode very much. There are blogs, there are podcasts. This talking urology is something that Joseph Ischia has been behind. He was a former fellow of ours back and he was back in Melbourne. Um, and of course, everyone likes a visual abstract. There are one of the, the banes of the publishing world is when you, you have a paper rejected and you want to submit it somewhere else and you have to reformat it. And the time it takes to reformat seems like such wasted time. And so there are journals that are now coming up with uh, free format submissions where they will, will not make you format it according to their rules until it's uh, accepted for publication. There was this, this um, study, the scientific sinkhole where they, they tried to put a monetary value on the cost of reformatting. And they, uh, they assumed that there were a median of four manuscripts a year that required a median of two submissions that reformatting took about 14 hours uh, per paper. So it's 52 hours per person per year. And based on a, a very modest income, I think uh, even our residents make more than that, uh, <laughs> that they, it was uh, $477 per manuscript or almost $2,000 per year. Anyway, there's, there's a high cost to reformatting, which seems like a total waste of time. And so the goal journal, uh, I think is the first journal in our field to do this, that they say, submit to, you know, your, your paper, your way, submit what you have, and we'll um, ask you to reformat when it's accepted at the end. There are, you know, it's all in the fine print. You still have to adhere to their word limit, which of course is one of the biggest problems. If you submit to a journal that allow, allows 3000 words, and now you have to submit to a journal that only allows 2,500, most of your effort is in shortening it. But that's, you know, I think that's welcomed by, by all of us. Preprints are interesting. I, I don't think that has affected us much in clinical research, but in the translational research in the lab, uh, it is it's becoming more and more popular. There are fields like physics and math where it's been commonplace for years to put your paper out there first and then get peer review. So the model currently across the top, of course, is you do the science, you write the paper, you submit it to the journal, goes out for peer review. If it's accepted, it's published. For the preprints, at the same time as you submit it to the journal, you post it on a public archive. There, there are archives like bioarchives, for example, and people can already access it. They can read it, they can, they can comment on it. And, and it also, in a world of, of staking claims of who did what first, your, your work is out there before you're um, scooped by anybody else. Open peer review takes it another level. So if you, if you do the, um, the preprints, of course, whoever comments on it, it's a bit of an open peer review. You see who's commenting on it. But open peer review does this in a very deliberate fashion where you submit a paper to a journal. It has to um, meet you know, all the criteria, formatting, et cetera. There's some processing. And then it's put on the journal's webpage and um, it, can, it can solicit uh, peer review just openly like that. So the journal's actually doing it, or you can actually send it out for peer review, letting the, the reviewers know that their name and identity will appear on 
the review. And of course, that the idea is that you you're going to overcome biases. So I think there's a lot of fear out there that that papers are being reviewed by friends. So I would say Wes Kasuf wouldn't be a professor at McGill if he didn't have me reviewing all his papers for him. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so there's you know there's that that kind of concern, um, and uh, but also the other way around that your your you know your enemy your arch enemy is reviewing your papers and keeping them out of publication, um, and then there's the the predatory journals that don't have adequate peer review, if it was an open process with names, it was transparent, we'd be able to weed out all of that. So the Journal of Urology is the first uh, in our world to do this. Um, and uh, Jay Smith started this as editor in chief and, and Rob Siemens uh, from Queens is now taking this on. And you are given the option. So first of all, they, they, they do want to publish all peer review next to the accepted papers. Importantly, if your paper is rejected, there's nothing open about it. It's only if it's accepted. If, accept, if it's accepted, you can read the paper, you can read the peer review. Uh, the other idea behind this is that there's a lot of really interesting and educational content in the reviewer comments. And you know, why waste that? Why not get that out there for the reader who's really interested in that topic as well? And then you have a choice as a reviewer whether you attach your name to it or not. So it can be either just open but anonymous or open with your name on it. Um, and I think, um, oh, oh, actually, it's back to your story. It's back to this slide. The one of the, you know, I think a lot of us are are hesitant to attach our names to something if it's critical, even if it's, you know, it's friendly, it's honest. But if it if it's really pointing out a lot of flaws, and it's a relatively small field where everybody knows everybody, you know, you're gonna um, generate some, some antibodies there. So I think a lot of review, I'm not a fan of, of, of attaching my name to a review. Um, but, uh, and a lot of people would be hesitant. And I think if we had, if we were forced to do it, people would hold back on some of their criticism and would be overly positive. It would be like Twitter where everything's all positive and everyone's happy and patting each other on the back, uh, which is not what we want. So anyway, why is it not? Why is why are we not really changing very quickly? And, and the bottom line is that we all need high impact publications, or we all want high impact publications in prestigious journals, and we don't want to publish in no name journals just because they're diamond open access, and it would require a real culture shift for us to do so. Um, so I was yeah, just back to this. So my own editorial thing. So I did a lot of peer review coming out of fellowship. And, um, and a lot of it came from Michael Droller, who was, is editor-in-chief of, European, of Urological Oncology. And so out of, from doing peer review, I became assistant um, editor in Urological Oncology handling bladder cancer papers. And then uh, was involved with these other two as well. But the one thing I always thought, looking at the editors-in-chief, I thought I never want to be editor-in-chief of a journal. <laughs> it looks like a horrible job. Time sink. Don't want it. Um, but then I did become editor in chief of the SIU journal um, because it was, uh, so the SIU is always uh, partnered with another journal. It was with BJUI for a while. It was with the world journal for a while. And these were always journals, if you're careful, because this is tape recorded, but uh, <laughs> these are all self-interested journals trying to make money and, and um, unwilling to chase. So the British journal, I don't know personally, I think it's a very good journal, the world journal, the publishers were would not change anything because they were happy with the current the status quo. They were making money. They did not want to improve quality. And, and it really didn't meet the needs of the SIU. And it's actually Laurie Klotz who started the CUAJ said, hey, we can do this in-house. And it, it only really costs what it costs to have a managing editor. Um, the SIU was paying about $100,000 a year to the World Journal to have that as a partner journal. Um, the World Journal was getting 10,000 new readers. Seems like a bit of a bum deal. Um, and instead, the money can be spent on a managing editor and some basic um, uh, IT support. You know, you need you need the web page and that type of thing. But that's really um, very cheap these days. And so it was all brought in house, and it's all done um, for free. So you know, the idea of having a a, a journal that is Diamond Open Access that suits the needs of, of a, a global um, urologic uh, audience um, 
was attractive uh, after all. So anyway, I will end there. <laughs>